Hello, everyone. My name is Arik Karim, and on behalf of the Japan Schools Debate Initiative, I'm more than happy to be, to be presenting the first lecture, the first of many, um, on various subjects in both world schools and British parliamentary debate. Today, I'll be delivering a lecture on style, rhetoric, and presentation. Essentially, what this will necessarily boil down to is going over just some of my background and experience in world schools and in interacting with the problems I've had with style and rhetoric and presentation and how I've been able to surmount that. Secondly, we'll be delving into the subject matter uh, for more concretely just looking into what exactly is meant by style and rhetoric and how exactly we can sharpen our presentation skills. And then thirdly, I'll take some questions and give you some answers and just do some note taking and try to provide any methods of solutions that I can immediately think of. That being said then, on background and experience. Hello, my name is Zari Karim. I already mentioned that a little bit earlier, but uh, I am from the United States. Uh, I'm a high schooler, grade 11, and I've been debating for the last four to five years in numerous speech and debate formats. Um, a lot of U.S.-based events like Congress, extemporaneous debate, impromptu, extemporaneous speaking. I now mostly compete in world schools debate and British parliamentary debate, but outside of debate, I'm passionate about journalism, political science research, and community service. Now, talking more concretely about the things that I've done specifically uh, in regards to like developing my voice and style and, and rhetorical development. I did a lot of video analysis of a lot of world schools rounds. Um, I mean, just like absolutely watching like round after round on a daily basis, um, probably like two or three rounds a day and, and taking notes. I learned the importance of developing your own style and not adopting someone else's just because it sounds good. And that's really something that I learned right from the get go, because I found that in the attempt to adopt someone else's voice or authority or style, it sounded different. It sounded unlike me. And a lot about what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is going to engage with the importance of developing your own style and in using video analysis, not necessarily to imitate or to replicate, but rather to get inspiration and then in turn develop your own voice. I also did a lot of drills to like root out bad habits and ticks for practice. I always focused on like one core issue I wanted to rectify at every tournament. That way you have more targeted sort of uh, solution sets and you're not just, uh, you know, aimlessly trying to improve everything, you know, do it one at a time. That way you have more precise application of solutions. And then there's also support and observation from mentors and fellow peers, um, kind of like the Japan Schools Debate Initiative. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that are more than willing to support you and, and are more than willing to hear you out and listen to you and help out in whatever way uh, they can in any capacity. So a support system is always great. There are gonna be five things I'm gonna do in this lecture. Firstly, I'm gonna help convey what is meant by the term style and rhetoric. Secondly, I'm gonna attempt to sharpen your ability to identify stylistic strength and rhetorical appeal, and also give a little bit of insight into the factors that influence it. Thirdly, I'll help you identify your strengths and attempt to build them up, and then identify weaknesses in the effort to break them down for presentation. Fourthly, we'll brainstorm some drills and practices to implement for your own improvement on your own time. And then fifthly, I'll clarify any remaining questions that you may have on anything I've discussed here, or truly anything in general related to world schools debate. On subject matter, what is style? Simply put, style is the execution of giving a speech, asking and taking POIs, so on and so forth. It's just a matter about how you go about doing the regular things that you would do in world schools. Style is built upon the unique characteristics uh, that, you know, is really inherent to an individual, right? I think that style is a lot about being unique, distinct, and consistent. I think that style is founded upon those things and the thing that makes someone stylistically good or stylistically strong is the notable traits that they have about them not necessarily just through speaking but you know just like their demeanor you know the way that they conduct themselves the way that they hold themselves um think about an individual or like a wsdc level or wudc level team who you think is really stylistically strong for me i always looked up to like for example like you know the Team Canada team from WSDC 2020 and 2021 that, um, you know, I always thought that they were super stylistically strong in terms of WUDC. I always looked up to like Bo So and Sheng Wu Li uh, and, you know, even like a couple of other people on the circuit. There are just a lot of people that I can immediately think of, but I want you to think of one in your head, right? What makes them uniquely good? 
What makes them have that style and what tactics and strategies make them rhetorically appealing? And if those two questions sounded or three questions sounded a little too complex, honestly, that's okay. And I think the more pressing question that'll help you get to the root of good style is uh, like what compelled you to continue listening to them. And there's almost always like an answer to that. And do a little bit of introspection, try to find your answer. And you'll find that the most common and consistent factor that is demarcated by good style is the fact that they have unique characteristics. They do something that is really remarkable and unique that is not necessarily um, commonplace among others in the circuit. Um, for example, I, I always found, you know, Gabby Lynn, for example, being like really, really good with illustrations and then other members really across all other kinds of WSDC teams having the unique characteristics of really being able to simplify a complex debate topic and, and really put it simply, um, for example, Matt Ansbruth with, with with like his whip speeches, very, very remarkably simple in boiling down the debate. There's just so many examples uh, and, you know, things that I can immediately think of. But this all goes to show that style is never uniform among everyone. And honestly, that's probably what makes style so important as a factor in adjudicating world schools debate. Um, the fact that everyone has their own distinct style in the attempt to like form your own style, I really think that you should just think about ways that you go about developing yourself and just stay on that trajectory. Um, and there's no such thing as wrong style, right? I think that it, everyone's preferences is different and that will always remain so. But as long as you stay true to yourself and the way that you would normally debate, um, as long as, of course, it's in like a respectful manner, um, you know, I think then that you will be doing great. You will have achieved success in developing your own style and in being comfortable in who you are as a debater. So in terms of delivery factors, there are two types of delivery factors, at least in, in my book, uh, the way that I categorize it. There's your vocal image and there's your visual image. So in terms of the vocal image, um, there are different factors within a vocal image. There's like tonal inflection and variation. That is um, the, the up and down of your voice, um, the, the lows and highs that might necessarily be inherent in your voice. And that's super important because that's what gets people's attention, right? If if I talk in a really monotone voice like this for the next five minutes, chances are you're probably going to leave the Zoom call and, and not return to another one of my lectures again. But this all goes to show that tonal inflection variation and the way that you vary your voice vocally is super important. And this also goes hand in hand with volume and pitch. Um, you know, if I talk really softly at some point or like talk really, really loudly, um, you can tell that it definitely has an effect and you don't want to maintain the same volume or pitch um, for like prolonged periods of time. However, it is worth noting that um, you can use volume and pitch to your advantage. And this also ties into vocal intensity, because at some points your rhetoric might necessitate greater amounts of passion or greater amounts of calmness. And in doing that, you will have caught the attention of your audience and your adjudicators and your fellow opponents because you are matching, you're vocally like, you know, aligning your voice with what you're actually saying. And when you actually have the attention and the care towards catering your voice towards what you're actually saying, you see then and only then are you truly going to be able to achieve um, what we think is like, high quality levels of stylistic strength. In terms of pausing, pacing, and phrasing, uh, phrasing, I think that it is very useful because at certain points, you do not want to maintain like the same level of like vocal intensity, same level of like volume and pitch, same level of like tonal inflection variation. But the same applies for speed uh, because if you're going consistently at the same speed, you will either have lost everyone because it just becomes like monotonous in the in the speed and pacing sense. And obviously you want to break out of that and you want to give it like a little bit of thought before you actually give your speech about what points in the speech should I be more slow? Maybe that's like the rhetoric. Maybe it's just I should adopt the conversational tone um, when explaining, you know, the the substantive tag and the thesis. 
maybe I want to be more emotionally passionate in like the, you know, impact section of my speech and in my first substantive. Um, and that might necessitate perhaps like slower pacing and more enunciated and, and articulate phrasing. So these are all just like small considerations and they don't make or break whether or not you win a round, but they do comprise of who you are as a debater and what you're remembered for. So that's why style and, and rhetoric and presentation is so important. In terms of the visual image, um, there are a couple of factors that influence, right? There's like your appearance, right? Um, while not like the biggest determinant, I think that online debate necessarily normalizes like cameras off debating and then you know you only like turn on your camera only if you want to but at in-person tournaments it is especially noteworthy um you know to understand that like your appearance and the way you look has like some ethos uh though it has some bearing on how other people perceive you um i honestly weight appearance a little bit less but i do think that body language and gestures and eye contact and facial expression are more important um in terms of visual image category and component uh, the way that, you know, you gesture, kind of like I'm doing right now, um, you don't want a lack of gesticulation and body language. That is um, the lack uh, or the missed potential that might be derived from not using body language or gestures effectively. But you also don't want to over gesticulate and, and you know, be over emphasizing with your body language because then it becomes distracting and detracting from what you're actually saying. In terms of eye contact and facial expression, you want to maintain the maximal amount of engagement because in doing that, you will have like people more hooked on what you're saying because you could have like the perfect pitch, the perfect like tonal inflection variation, vocal intensity, pausing, pacing, phrasing. You can have all of those things. But at the end of the day, it's about whether or not you actually are effectively able to engage with your audience. And it's better to do that. And it's easier to do that when, you know, you're truly engaging with them by, you know, like looking at them by uh, being less like paper reliant or, you know, computer reliant and like staring at your document. Um, those are all just like small considerations that play in the style. All right. So in terms of rhetorical choices, um, there are two things. There's linguistic elements. Uh, and there's desirable syntactical qualities. In terms of linguistical elements, there's just like a lot of different things that we as a society find rhetorically pleasing. There's like triads, alliteration, repetition, contrasting pairs, analogies, audience conscious pronouns, rhetorical questions, imagery, etc. cetera. Um, these are things that you would notice, you know, at some point, uh, the more speeches you listen to. And I'm not just talking about debate. Perhaps you listen to like a presidential speech or like a prime ministerial speech um, or like a speech from any like member or like leader in like your country's government. You'll notice that their speech writers or maybe, you know, that could be themselves in some instances. You'll notice that if you pick up on these different linguistic elements, they're very much ingrained and interspersed throughout the speech because we as a society know that these are the things that that are rhetorically pleasing and that we will listen to that maintain and capture our engagement and our attention and these things spice up your speech but they're completely optional right you should do what feels most comfortable for you and these are just like some small suggestions as to how exactly you go about implementing some linguistic elements to improve your rhetorical uh you know choices and in turn your style So the second category is on desirable syntactical qualities. There's a, a lot to be said about the importance of concision and clarity in like your world school speeches, right? In terms of like your roadmap, your signposting, your explanation, the mechanizations, your structure, so on and so forth. An important component and an important factor that I think really makes uh, a certain set of individuals in like national teams all around the world stand out is the fact that they value the the decrease in jargon and complexity and increase the amount of clarity and, and simplicity. Um, and the reason why that's so important is because you want to make your speech as highly accessible as possible. And, you know, your adjudication panel are likely to be composed of a very diverse set of individuals, especially for like online international tournaments. Um, so with that, uh, concision and clarity is highly, highly important because it also gives you a strategic advantage, right? It not only like makes it uh, like easier to understand, but it also gives you more room for content. And, you know, there's a lot of, of strategical benefits to be had there. 
I think another important thing is to have a consistent team line, a consistent stance, and you know have some rhetorical zingers um, across your bench and and you know consistent throughout your speech because what really you know is, is super crucial is not only just having really really high level like substantive material like positive material right but it's also pairing that with with like the rhetoric that makes the speech so necessarily engaging in the first place for example um wsdc 2021 um in like the semi-final round i believe was it with canada versus singapore uh, there was, you know, the the pharmaceutical motion, uh, the nationalization of a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I remember, you know, one one team line that you know remains resonant in my head to this day, even after having watched that round, you know, a while back. Is uh, it's time to end the tyranny of pharmaceutical companies, and it's because that I'm the fact that we're, I'm able to remember this that makes it so necessarily memorable and intertwined with their case, right? I can tell you all about the the case that was presented from, uh, you know, Canada in that round because of like the consistent team line that you see inherent in in their bench. Um, you know, another thing, you know, let's take like a WUDC example. Um, obviously, the very famous uh, WUDC 2016 Thessaloniki uh, final, a uh, grand final with um, OG, Harvard A, right, Boso, everyone remembers the iconic, um, you know, uh, speech about the Marxist revolution motion. And I guarantee you, most everyone in this call, if not everyone, can recite the Boso intro word for word uh, and from memory. So this all goes to show that memorability is super important. And having a consistent team line and giving an implicit underlying message about what you want to convey, not just in terms of subject matter or like actual hard positive material, but also in terms of just like the general message. Um, those are super important things. And you'll begin to notice and realize that uh, rhetoric plays a lot bigger of a factor in determining, you know, the outcome of debate and, and the memorability of an individual or a team a lot more than you think. Okay, so I want to briefly chat about illustrations, examples, and analogies and thought experiments. Um, the reason why this warrants its own section is because they not only are a factor in improving you know, the quality of your of your intuition and your brainstorming um, to actually produce positive material and, and substantive matter. But it's also super helpful because it enhances your style. Um, so what is illustration, right? Illustration, simply put, is giving your audience a, like the ability to, you know, really be able to conceptualize what exactly you're talking about. Because you might have like a really arbitrary and abstract mechanization, um, but people will not truly understand what you mean until you provide an example or, you know, you do some illustration and show your audience what exactly you're referring to. It also just makes like the concepts of your mechanizations more accessible when you're able to actually give the visualization and provide the imagery and give the hard concrete example that, you know, is is going to ultimately determine their ability to understand or just be completely confused and puzzled by what you're talking about. So illustrations are super strategically instrumental to winning the debate in both style and matter because they help you brainstorm. They help you think of, you know, me more mechanizations and like actually support your mechanizations and explanations and layers of analyses with, um, you know, real intangible examples. But it also helps you, you know, in the style aspect for the, all of the reasons that I stated earlier. So the question then is how do we produce high quality illustrations? Now, a lot of this actually happens during prep. More often than not, you might have an individual that is solely dedicated to just producing illustrations, if not everyone. But I'm sure that everyone will be able to have some contribution in, um, you know, providing some examples and, and providing like some illustrations in general. So one way to go about producing high quality illustration would be through thought experiments. So the utility of thought experiments being to tease out our intuition and arguments and help us simplify content and understand what an actor's priorities or incentives truly are. And we'll get into an example of this in the second slide. We also think that like another way to produce high quality illustrations is through diversity and examples and analogies. You want to remember that this is world schools debate. So having, you know, mechanizing and really using like your um, 
really using like your ability for like international relations um, kind of like subject matter in spec is really, really useful at the point in which you can really employ them as examples and as illustrations in your case. And it also proves not only the fact that you're very like versatile in your knowledge, but it also proves necessarily that, you know, you know what you're talking about, that you are able to back up your arguments, not necessarily with like a solely like Western centric set of illustrations and examples, but a diverse set that really um, is representative of the global aspect uh, uh, and the global nature and scale of your case. And uh, next slide, we'll be discussing why challenging and teasing out your intuition aids in the formation of your style. So let's think about this. Um, before I delve into the example that is on the screen, um, the example for thought experiments that are usually circulated around the, the World Schools debate and WUDC and BP circuit uh, is the example, you know, it's like they're, they're like a frequent set of examples. But um, I think that's something that is worth noting is that in a, like a lot of the lectures that I've been in, um, there's always been one to two examples. I'll go over one of them. Um, so this is something that Jason Shao uh, mentioned in his charity workshop on principles, extension, and fiat. And uh, there'll be a link to this after. But one example is basically like the concept of, right, like human survivalism. So let's say, you know, this is Jason's example, right? Let's say that there is like a bear or you, there is you on an island, right? You were stranded alone on an island and there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to drink, um, right? Presumably other than like salt water, uh, which is, which can kill you. Um, there's nothing to eat, nothing to drink. There's no materials or resources and no way for you to like call for help. Um, so given that there is just you, but you see a bear. Now the question is, is it principally justified and is it fair for you to like consume the bear? And what Jason tells us is that most people would say yes, even environmentalists, right? Because it's done out of the principle of necessity. However, Jason's second modified example on like the same, you know, general, uh, you know, broad theme in the second scenario is let's have that exact same scenario situation. But instead of a bear, let's say that there's another human. And that's where people disagree. Right. That is where we develop the intuition that, OK, we think that, you know, the consumption of animals is morally permissible, but the consumption of humans, even when, you know, there's a situation that there's no other alternative and, and you know, you need to do something in order to survive. We as humans still think that is um, morally impermissible. Right. We think that's still morally wrong. And the, the reason why that is and the reason why this is so rhetorically powerful and, and, you know, so strategically useful in terms of thought experiments and, and really fleshing out your style and your intuition is because in doing this thought experimentation, we are better able to draw the line and really, you know, teeter on the margins, understand where exactly and at what point do we find something to be acceptable and unacceptable. Uh, so let's take, a, you know, a, the second example, right? I, this is something that is mentioned by both Lucia Arce and Jason Shao uh, in both of like their lectures, both of which once again are going to be linked at the end of this presentation. Um, so that is like the example of like incest, right? That is, um, we as a society find it morally impermissible and necessarily like disgusting um, as like a visceral reaction when we think about incestuous behavior. And what Jason does is kind of like take Lucia's example of this and, and really adds like the second scenario. So the first scenario being, let's assume that, you know, there is a brother and a sister that engage in that kind of behavior, right? The second scenario is like essentially the attempt to like really like strip away the objectionable parts of, um, you know, incest. That is um, the fact that, you know, let's say that the brother and sister do not know each other. Let's say that they are, you know, both adopted. So they have like, they have no assumption that they are biologically related. Um, so for all of those instances, um, let's say that those are like the circumstances that really set the second scenario. Essentially, the reason as to why exactly we are now able to draw like the visceral gut reaction is because like 
there is like kind of like consent and there is like awareness about like the biological relationship um, that is necessarily inherent, right? Uh, so let's take a look at this example real quick. So on like the moral gray area of designer brand clothing versus fast fashion, this is an example that I came up with myself. Viscerally, why would someone prefer clothing items from designer brands over fast fashion, right? Let's say that like environmental uh, like damages and environmental considerations aside, it really, if you just wanted to care about how you look, fast fashion is cheaper in cost and has the same look, right? If you delve into it deeper and actually engage in a thought experiment, you're going to realize that humans care about branding and the perception that designer brand clothing actually has on others. And you're going to begin to realize that maybe it is necessarily the case that some people are going to justify having like saying, you know, like claiming that like fast fashion is environmentally damaging after the fact in an attempt to justify their preference. So really engaging in thought experiments really helps you with your style and really helps you be just become like a better debater. Um, in terms of drills and practices, uh, there are four things, right? Um, there's like a vocal and visual image analysis. I would like record you with like your phone giving like a speech. Um, first, turn your like the volume down and just look at like how you how you're like speaking, right? Um, or like how you look. Um, not necessarily like how exactly, uh, you know, you're vocalizing things. And then after you're done with that, put your phone down and then just listen to how you're speaking, right? Just listen to like the vocal image. Uh, and then you will have seen the visual image prior. And do that separately and then note your areas of strength and weakness. Secondly, you do like tone maintenance practice. So just like practice reading something in like one tone and then apply that um, appropriately to like a speech. There's also like stop and, stop and repeat drills to root out bad ticks. And then reading a lot of source material and listening to rounds and even general public addresses and speeches, I always thought was super, super helpful. And, you know, it's it's always something that I continue to do do this day. Uh, for the live practice, we'll probably delve into this um, a little bit because I know that we have about eight minutes remaining in this meeting. Um, so I can probably just like kickstart a new meeting at this point, but, um, yeah, just rejoin. I'm going to put in a new Zoom link and uh, I'll see you all in two minutes. All right, welcome back. We just generated a new Zoom link, but now what we're going to be doing is doing a live practice. Um, so this is based on a motion that I debated at the 2022 Croatia Winter Holidays Open. And I think that out of all of the rounds that I've been in um, throughout like prelims, partial of the block to finals, octafinals, quarterfinals and semifinals, I'm fairly confident uh, in saying that this is my favorite. And this came from partial of the block to finals um, in our round against uh, Team Germany Stuttgart. So the motion reads, this house would allow voters to dismiss their government during its elected term through citizen initiated referenda. And we were on the opposition here. Um, so I want you to take some time to think about like the rhetoric and the team line that you would want to use in your speech and push down the bench, right? What is like the implicit underlying message behind your side's advocacy and positive material? What is the narrative that you're attempting to further on your side of the house? And, you know, while you're at it, you might as well just think of like some broad general ideas for arguments, but I can give all of you about five minutes or so uh, to jot and come up with some ideas. So we can do that um, in that instance if, if it does help. So take five. All right, so that has been five minutes. Um, so now what I want to do is kind of get some of your insights. If for any of you that are comfortable vocalizing and sharing, um, what exactly you've got in terms of just like rhetoric ideas and team line. Um, they would want to use in your speech. So uh, is there anyone who'd be willing to go first? Who'd like to speak? Hello. Hey, Natsuki. Um, can I go? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, um, I'm sorry, I'm not that confident. But I thought that what I thought from the opposition side of this motion was that um, governments now simply cannot do things that are going to be hated by the people. And so, um, so the likelihood of this is that I think this is pretty likely because the governments and like the politicians like um want to like sustain power within the nation and this is the prerequisite to any type of thing they want to do through like like policies they've got but the why like the 
uh, important part is that I think unpopular opinion can usually be like the solution. Like for example, when you consider things like lockdown in cities, even this if this was like extreme, even like um so like maybe like on a generic case, any things that can that tries or like aims to actively prevent COVID nineteen can be something that people hate. Insofar as that like restricts economic activities, and that is the things that people usually want to do, but this is actively harmful because that will give like the active harm in the long term. And so the reason why it's not an overgeneralization is that um I think usually people or like human beings are unable to make long term choices because things that are coming in the short term are usually like easier to see or like are visible right and so the illustration and example here is that imagine a teacher giving students tough homework and tough like classes and um like for the purpose of this like philosophical question just imagine that this is like a great great teacher and right now this is con like considered as a teacher that and that is continuing but if the students can just vote out of it probably people will veto this po like teacher and probably te like this student will not want this like teacher because that is tough and that um people want to play games or watch anime or whatever they want to do so like the conclusion here is that those like managers like those like governments simply are not able to do things that are going to be hated and I think the impact stretches further. And I think I have zero mechanisms here, but in the worst case scenario, uh, maybe you can like um, connect to things like populism, trying to get popularity or, I mean, no, this is zero mechanisms. But secondly, I think what I thought was that this will create a significant chilling effect because, the, because like the government or like the politicians will actively try to prevent referendums from happening in so far as that can lead them to lose power within the nation. So I think that, I think so like um, politicians or like people will like, um try to actively refrain from things that might get people to hate him or like might people to like um like to get like um concern over the government or hate over the government so that is why there's going to be less discussion within the parliament that was what like what was i thought okay i really like a couple of like the ideas that you know you you mentioned here i love the fact that you explained why your arguments and you know and why your assertions were not over generalizations and why they were like you know like structurally strong um, so that's that's really great. So thank you so much. Um, I, there are two things that I want to really underscore from what we just heard from Natsuki. Um, firstly, that humans act on their will, right? If we were to boil down and condense everything that, that Natsuki said for the first 30 seconds, it would be that humans act on their will. That is, people might be discontent or dissatisfied with certain governmental policies and as a result, they're going to try to like use citizen initiated referenda as a way to lash out at their government. And then secondly, that humans are short sighted in their perspective. Um, that is, they're unable to understand the utility of certain, you know, economic policies, for example, like increasing like the interest rate um, that might cause some short term harms, but long term benefits. And because humans are very, and especially citizens in the context of governments, are so short-termist, um, you know, that, that's a really great thing to point out. So you, we kind of see how, you know, you, you're able to, like, condense and boil down um, the, the general ideas of arguments, and then we can brainstorm ways to, like, concretely turn this into rhetoric. So I'm going to pull up my partial double octafinals case, and... Uh, here essentially what we ran was that all right yeah okay the first one is on like the degradation of politics right um because politicians don't know if they're like satisfying people 24 7 you know if citizens might as well just like vote them out if they are dissatisfied at a mass scale the difference then is that with citizen initiated referenda, they're able to like really display their discontent um, and really attempt to like, uh, you know, take out like government um, as frequently as possible, assuming that that dissatisfaction is constant, um, which it might not be right. It could just be because of like one policy that like really upsets you. Um, so there's that, right? That is one like mechanism and short termism. Um, funnily enough, was the first mechanism in in our first piece of positive material on degradation of politics. So you hit it right on. Um, the second thing that we have here, our second like mechanization on our uh, first piece of positive material, is our decreased incentive uh, incentive to compromise. That is, um, 
you need to compromise with like someone on like the opposite side of like the political spectrum or someone that doesn't necessarily fit within like your political party or ideology um because you know you have to like work and function as a government right if the precedent that you set under like this motion is that um you can just have voters dismiss their government through their elected term through citizen initiated referenda then why exactly would you ever support like any bipartisan cooperation if you could just initiate referenda and attempt to institute like a government with like-minded and like affiliated you know kind of statuses um so there's that thirdly um the third mechanization really ties in the second is the fact that like compromise is important because it makes policies that are long-standing that both sides can agree on once again playing to the bipartisan um you know framework or approach fourthly um, this kind of like a highest ground response, like a, an implicit concession that sometimes the political climate isn't very good in politics, but, you know, you don't have to prove that it is. It, it just becomes worse on their side. And then fifthly, um, that because both politicians and citizens view the party in power as an enemy, politics is already getting increasingly divisive, but you only increase politicization um, in their world. So that's essentially the first piece of pause material. And the impacts are really simple, right? Firstly, um, you have less accountability because they distract from elections, uh, like general and primary elections, and reduce its value. You make the democratic process less legitimate, and you make the election system less absolute. And that, in turn, allows voters to vote more on a whim instead of truly considering like policy positions. Um, and there's more smear politics. So overall, there's less trust in government, more polarization, less policies passed due to less compromises, which leads to a government that is less likely to be productive. Um, so that was essentially a first piece of pause material. And a lot of what Nasuki mentioned, actually, really like ties into that. And I think that really the only thing that I had to add to what, you know, what we heard from Natsuki is um, really just like the the decreased cooperation and really you know pair short termism with decreased cooperation and you essentially what we have um for our first substantive that we ran in partial double octafinals um so in in brainstorming and doing this um not only are we better able to like structure and really think about our our concrete subject matter and and our substantive and, and positive material but now we're able to think about ways that we can incorporate the different things that we talked about earlier. So what are some examples, you know, or what are, if what are some illustrations or things that we can do? If we like turn back, right? If we go to like some previous slides here, um, what are like some, you know, examples of illustrations that we can implement here? What are like some thought experiments that we can truly consider? You're gonna notice that when I was talking you through um, our first piece of pause material in our case that we actually ran in partial double octafinals, what I did was I, I showed you the difference between general elections and then like citizen initiated referenda. Assuming that there's always going to be a, a certain set of individuals in society that are dissatisfied or discontented with their government, what is the difference between citizen initiated referenda in general elections, right? Because presumably you can vote out people in, in general elections, but the difference is that now you're able to do that more frequently. And then you assess the actual effects of that, right? In the case of opposition, you assess and examine the harms. So you can kind of notice that implicitly and like kind of like sneakily, like, you know, through in a thought experiment there, um, you know, not even to like my own like awareness, but these are just things that you naturally do in order to develop a more concrete kind of approach to having like strong and solid arguments. Um, so yeah, if are there any other contributions or ideas for the for the live practice? If not, uh, we can move on. Uh, so yeah, uh, now at this point, it's just like question and answer segment. So the way that it'll work is just, you know, um, you guys can ask really anything that comes to mind. Um, but if there's something that you can't immediately think of, you can, of course, always DM me uh, or, or, you know, send me an email, which is always fantastic. But yeah, are there any any questions at this time? If so, feel free to vocalize it and just unmute and let me know. Um, Hello. Hey. Can I have like a few questions? Sure, of course. Um, like about the thing, wait, um, was, could you like give me like, um, things 
wait, could you like discredit things if there were something that I said earlier on, like in the times when you asked me? Sure. So if I were to discredit anything, I think that um the ideas you know you presented were um more reminiscent of just like your strategy to the case, which makes sense. Obviously, you need to do that before you actually like apply like rhetoric or anything. But um, it it's like, I think hmm. I really liked the the ideas that you had. But I think that eventually, the more you debate and the more that you you know you kind of do like this kind of like brainstorming and like thought experiments and you know intuition games is uh you become more concise not only you know in or you not only become better in terms of like actually brainstorming things you become more concise in your explanation so notice how um in like the previous slide right uh so i essentially boil down what you're saying for like 90 seconds into like 20 right um mm, the fact that humans true. act on their will that you know they're going to try to initiate citizen um initiated referenda out of just because they're going to be like super dissatisfied with something and secondly that humans are extremely short termist that is they're unable to understand like governmental policy and and long term uh implications and reasoning so i think uh, i don't really have much to discredit with what you're saying because i really liked all of the ideas um but what i really do want to point out that i really liked was that um you explained why you know what you're saying was unique, uh, which which is always great because I feel like all arguments should always have like a layer of uniqueness to them and why they are, um, you know, not non-unique. So that is great. So, you know, I don't really have much to say there. Um, any other questions? Um, a couple more. I have a question. I have a few questions, but like if any other people out there wants to question, then um yeah, here, I can it. check the chat. Okay, got it. So yeah, go for it, Natsuki. Okay. Um you earlier mentioned that there was like a, there were a few communities of like Discord or like support um mm -hmm. that um um if it was like if it was like possible, could you like um give me a few links of like public Discord that can be useful? Yeah, I I can I definitely can do that. Um you know, JSDI is one of them. Uh, it's like mm -hmm. a little, you know, where we're trying to make it more active. But uh, mm -hmm. there, there are like a, I know that there are like some online forums. Uh, I can definitely link you to it. And honestly, resources and like self improvement and like preparation that might be like another lecture in and of itself. So you know, you never know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can I can definitely provide you a link. Yeah. Any other mm -hmm. questions on anything that I said in this presentation? Um, I have like two more questions, but it's not sure. related to this. No um, worries. <laughs> um, so firstly, um, I heard that you are in your fourth, fifth year of debate, right? Yes. Um, I'm at like the first and a half year part of debate experience. Okay, very nice. Um, so um, sorry for this abstract, ab like abstract question, but like, do you no have anything about like what you were doing back then and what it was like a good thing, bad thing, etc. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm really glad you asked this. And, you know, the debate community is always great in that, you know, when you start off, there's, there's always like a learning curve. There's always something that you take away from, from every video, every round, every lecture. Um, I hope, you know, you really learn a lot. And I think that most of like your learning will begin in the first one to two years of your debate career. So I think that uh, if there's one thing that I would have done more of that I did a little bit of, but, you know, I wish I did a little bit more was um, more round analysis because I found myself doing a lot more round analysis only like last year or maybe like a little bit like year before, like 20, you know, tw like maybe ha like mid, mid, midway or mid year into 2021. Uh, so I think that, round analysis and 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 taking notes and following along with the debate is never a bad idea because um you're able to follow the round as it happens and you know you're also like unaware about what is going to be said next but you know that's also like the other speakers in the debate so i think that round analysis is something that i would definitely highly recommend uh and taking notes 
not just on like their arguments, but maybe on how you would do something different than what they did. Maybe you would respond differently. Maybe you would like make their responses like and their you know refutation more concise and boil it down. Um, I know that something that I did was like I I paused the video when I when I wanted to practice like a certain speech. I would start the round from the beginning. I would listen, uh, you know, to like the speeches, uh, and I would just stop the video. And usually, I did this for like whips because I specialize in whips now. But last year, I used to do like a lot of deputies and replies, and I still do. But um, just pause the video right before the person is about to give their speech on the side, and, and then you give the speech. Uh, then mm -hmm. what you can do after you give the speech, uh, you know, assuming you have it recorded, is play it back, note like what you like mentioned and then compare it to what they said. Um, so then you could see if there's anything that you missed out on that you didn't pick up in terms of maybe some like important response. Maybe like there is like this argument that that had gone dropped uh, or like cold conceded. Uh, so round analysis is definitely something that I highly recommend. I also think that a lot of the drills and the practices that I mentioned earlier, I kind of rushed through them a little bit because we, had, we were running low on time. But uh, these are also things that I didn't really think that I did a lot of in like my first year of debate that, um, you know, I wish I did more, uh, especially the tone maintenance practice, because uh, especially in other events now that I do, you know, U.S. based events like congressional debate, I find myself always turning back to like world schools and like adopting like the conversational tone um, and a lot of like my speeches. So you find that, you know, applying like these kind of drills and practices, I hope is super helpful. And uh, in general, just, you know, being as actively involved as possible, like in, you know, as many practice rounds, um, I want you like, you know, perhaps like set like some parameters for uh, like how committed or dedicated you want to be to debate. And obviously, um, you know, I'm truly appreciative that you guys are here at this lecture. And I, I, there are so many other resources, like especially online. There's like the Manchester Debating Union, the Astana Debating Union. Uh, there's um dispute tandem debating 404 digital matter files like so many you know communities and and you know resource centers that are out there that uh you can do like some reading from so i think round analysis practices and drills uh practices and drills third i think um you know exploring resources online uh and then oh, exploring resources online. And then fourthly, I think doing some more like reading. So more like acquisition, more acquisition of, can't type today, Acquis, acquisition of spec slash um, concrete material through readings and research. Dash. Uh, I, I almost always set about 15 to 30 minutes a day um, just reading, just, you know, just going on like credible sites like the Atlantic or or, um, you know, sometimes even just like watching a little bit of Sky News um, to get a, updates on like European events uh, and even like South China Morning Post. Uh, there are like a lot of favorites. So I might as I might like compile like a, a list and send it over. Uh, if that does help you, but there, there's like a lot of like resources and, and you know, readings and sources and, and sites out there that, that can definitely help you. So yeah, those, those are the four things I'd recommend. Anything Thank you else? so much. Um, can I keep going on? Yeah, yeah, sure. We've got like another like good, like eight minutes. So yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so basically, um, how do you like matter file to like the, I have a will to contribute like everything to debate, but like I really find my way like of learning really, really slow, especially when compared to people like Yon because he reads so fast and he writes so fast and he do, like does things um so fast. But like what I usually do is that I read through the articles and then I sum up and then like add things towards like Matterfowl and then I have like different docs and like different variety of like topics like wow. geopolitics. IR like etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah so like is it like the, was there something like bad if you can point it out um or mm -hmm. I think those are no I think those are really good things honestly um I wish I I wish I did that because I don't think I really categorize like all of, like my knowledge and it was really just like 
during prep, um, or at least for like prepared uh, motions, you know, during prep, I, I would always have to like rack my brain thinking about examples. But if you're able to categorize and, you know, have them in, in like those subfolders, that's fantastic, because really, it's like excellent organization. And, you know, it's, um, I think if there is one thing that I encourage you to do, it's find a way to like apply like those like, you know, matter files um, more concretely into like your case, right? Maybe you're now going to like use like some examples of, of like global events happening for like a certain motion in like your matter files in like your actual case, right? Find a way to like not forget about the things like that you're like filing um, into like your subfolders and apply, you know, like your readings into like your actual, um, you know, case. So I remember, uh, you know, very distinctly that I had learned a lot about the United Nations, uh, you know, permanent five, you know, from like the United Nations Security Council. And the reason I remembered that and I was when when I debated that um, I was able to like draw on like a lot of like spec and knowledge on it is because I read about the UN, um, you know, a couple of years prior in their operations and all of that. So always find a way to, you know, really integrate illustrations, right, and, and rhetorical choices um, through through like your spec. So I would highly recommend, you know, just finding ways to like integrate into your case. But I think what you're doing is great. I don't think that there is much to discredit there. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Awesome. Um, yeah, of course. How do you make um like life and debate compatible? Like how do you is there like any tips on like how you intertwine it with like things like school education or like things like that or like, other activities? Yeah. You do? Yeah. So um Honestly, I think that I, uh, you know, my approach to debate has always been just maximizing the amount of time I spend on it because, you know, I was very like dedicated and like passionate about it. And I still am, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm here at this tournament, uh, in a different state, but, uh, I think that, uh, yes, is an important like work-life balance and like extracurricular academic balance is super important. And, uh, I think that the way that you do this is by thinking about the tournaments that, you know, you, you are definitely sure that you want to attend, but making time every week, maybe like one practice round, like a week with like your friends, um, doing like some spars, maybe even like some front half BP, uh, finding ways to, you know, make it such that you're, you know, you're still like actively like engaging with like debate and that you're keeping up with things. Obviously doing reading is like essential for you. Um, but, you know, finding ways to decrease the amount of pressure on yourself is super important at the point of which um, mm -hmm. the, the pressure like that you might put on yourself might be overbearing if you put too much on yourself. Uh, so I think that's why like doing like fun, casual things like, like, you know, like zooming with like your debate friends and and like doing like some practice debates or even like talking about like some articles that you all read together, um, finding ways to integrate like some some fun in debate is great mm -hmm. and and also just prioritizing and having a clear understanding for okay i'm going to do this 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 at this point this point this point obviously you don't need to have like your entire debate career planned out but um just having some broad general idea about where you want to like do certain or like at what point you want to do certain tournaments to, like really practice and apply you know you like your your skills that you've picked up from like spars um finding ways to make debate fun um, is really like what I highly encourage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, you know, if at any point, you know, a debate or your extracurriculars are interfering with your academics, I say, take a small step back. Um, you know, think about your priorities. What do you care about? Um, and I find that, you know, academics and, and extracurriculars go hand in hand and having a good balance um, and succeeding in both is super essential. Yeah. So um, I think that I... That, that'll pretty much summarize and conclude the lecture for today. If there are any other questions that you guys have, do feel free to just reach out to me on Discord. Um, here's just some of like the compiled resources of things that I mentioned throughout this lecture. So um, there is this excellent, fantastic book called Good Arguments by Boso. It really helped me understand like debate concepts and really eliminated like the jargon um, from like a lot of the debate concepts that I, I was really struggling with. The, the first two videos here that you see are from like Lucia, Arose, and uh, Jason Xiao. 
uh, were encompassing of like the thought experiments that I mentioned. The Macau Online WSDC 2021 semifinals was what I mentioned um, in terms of like a round that I really remembered for you know high quality illustration from from one of the speakers. And there are like a ton of other excellent rounds, right? You can just search up WSDC on YouTube, and there's just like a ton of compiled resources and and things that you'll find online. So yeah. Uh, Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for, for attending the first lecture of the Japan Schools Debate Initiative. And there will definitely be many, many more. And I truly appreciate all of you for being here. So thank you so much. And no matter what time you're watching, morning, afternoon, evening, night, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative. And I hope that there's something you took away from it. So yeah. Bye, everyone.